Well, hello again. I was saying it, it, it's, it's taking us always um, a while to get going. But um, I do hope that uh, when we do get going, then uh, we'll be able to keep on going. Um, just giving a very brief introduction of how this event came to be and the sort of themes that come under this very lengthy title. I mean, we start with, with the knowledge, all of us, that um, almost the whole building industry today claims uh, sustainability. But how true are these claims? And what, in our case, uh, do we mean by sustainable design? I'm not going to try to define it in any other way than to say that probably all of us here would see it both as a process of how to design or a practice and also as the product of this practice. And from that viewpoint, there were three um, key issues that seemed to transpire. One, the notion of technology as know-how, know as both the hardware and the software. In other words, both partly the how of the process of sustainable design, and then also the what of the product, something which in many ways would appear as a precondition in order to have this thing called sustainable design. But as many of us know, very often appearing as an afterthought, a prosthetic element of a building. So that technology became an issue uh, for this event, something to discuss, debate and uh, clarify perhaps. Then secondly, the notion of performance. In other words, the what for, why we're doing it. Um, an objective, uh, possibly also a target, i.e. something more specific. Uh, for example, comfort at uh, low emission. What's our experience there? Well, it's rarely as good as claimed. Much is claimed. And uh, thirdly, an issue and I think here, using the word issue, I mean uh, a question of innovation, a possible, not necessarily a certain outcome, which um, positively could be seen the, the, the outcome of responding positively to a, a new challenge, architecturally an opportunity for new expression. In practice, sometimes desired, often feared or unwanted. So this is how these three key issues came as part of the, uh, the topic. Technology, performance, innovation. And um, as a positive resolution, if you wish, uh, technology is the know-how, both the hardware and the software, hopefully the right ones, performance, hopefully leading to a comfort in buildings and outdoors at zero carbon emission, and then innovation, a response to climate change and other issues, uh, hopefully, uh, in my viewpoint, uh, new modes of architectural expression. <coughs> of course, there are many other 
attributes, expectations and manifestations that individually or collectively we might perceive or wish to find. <coughs> so then, um, when we look at this sustainable design again as a process and a product, what contribution do we have, have we seen so far from architectural practice? Uh, just to be a little provocative, or maybe it's not even provocative, uh, I would say so far small and sometimes negative in, in, in the sense that uh, the outcome is actually misleading in, in directions which perhaps are not productive or claiming something that has not been fulfilled. Um, and from architectural education, well, so far I can't see much more than sustainable design being an optional technical addendum. And, and so the key question that I would, uh, I would put in, in the beginning would be then, so is it a technical addendum? Or should we accept it as a technical addendum in architectural education and then tell people get the know-how in practice? But if you can, because in my view, practice doesn't have it either. Or is it a key ingredient? Do you, we want it to be a key ingredient in a new practice and then we need a different approach to education. So this is one of the, uh, the questions I would like to put and, and hopefully one that we can uh, discuss. Um, as you probably know from the announcement, this event is co-organized with the International Union of Architects and uh, it is a hope and expectation that some of the findings perhaps can be transported to the um, um, UIA's conference in Istanbul in, in a couple of months. And we have here Nikos Findikaik is representing the UIA and um, also the director of the working group on architecture and renewable energy sources and I'd like to introduce him at this stage and he will give a short introduction to the purpose of that working group, Nico. Very few words uh, on behalf of uh, UIA, the International Union of Architects. I would like to thank the Architectural Association of London and especially Simos for hosting this symposium, which has a main aim to contribute to the role of architectural education for implementing renewable sources in the architectural design. UIA is a huge international organization of architects comprising about 150 state members all over the world and does an international congress every three years where debates between leading architects formulate the tendencies for the future. The activities of uh, UIA mainly is the support and organization of the international architectural competitions and the guidelines for architectural practice, the main activities. UIA scope is also the interchange of information between the state members and the enlargement of the role of the architect. UIA is uh, mainly supported by 15 to 20 international work groups focusing in different subjects as habitat, urban planning, patrimony, culture, environment, sustainability, sport and leisure, education, tourism, etc. Three years ago started the work group named ARES, Architecture and Renewable Sources, under my direction and the support of the Technical Chamber of Greece. This group is very well linked and collaborates with the Group for Sustainable Design, directed by Professor Kazuo Iwamura from Tokyo, who is present today and he will speak to you. Here also is present and will speak to you Professor Geren John, director of the work group for Sport and Leisure. The four major issues of the RS work group are the incorporation of renewable sources in an urban built environment, the educational and informational procedures for architects and engineers, 
the research for the new technologies in this field, and of course to try to find a low status for implementing uh, renewable sources. The results of this symposium will be presented during the coming World Congress in Istanbul, 3 to 7 of July, and I invite all of you to participate. Thank you, Simus. Okay, thank you, Nikos. Um, well, we're going to start the program now. We have about, well, not about, we have 14 presentations, um, seven in the morning and uh, seven in the afternoon. Um, I realize now that the times are really very tentative there, um, but um, we will try to keep close to them, and then we finish the day with this round table discussion. Uh, I should say that during the presentations there won't be that much time to, to ask questions. It, it would be better if we collect the questions and um, at um, various points um, in the day we've left, we've left time uh, for some um, quick questions. And then the, the round table uh, <coughs> session is quite lengthy and uh, there will be plenty of time there to, to discuss. So. I would like now to introduce uh, Alexandros Tombazis. Uh, he um, is um, an architect of long, long standing. He's set up his practice in Athens in uh, the 1960s, a practice which uh, grew into international reputation with uh, built projects both inside and outside uh, Greece and uh, now employs about 70 people. Um, I should say, although he might not like me to say so, that he's a competition addict um, with um, about 300 or more, I lose count, he, he does too, so we don't know which number is the correct one, um, with about 300 entries, of which I think about 90 have given uh, national and or uh, international prizes. Uh, he was also the recipient of the PLEA International Passive and Low Energy Architecture Award in 1998. Alex Tombales. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I'll just start by saying that the competitions are less than 200, so you must oh, go to the state, but doesn't that? Um, I will be speaking about uh, the education of architects. And as you well know, I'm not a teacher. And I hope that the teachers here will not be too furious about me intervening in their field. Yes. Try that one. Yes, that's it. That's fantastic. So, uh, yes, that's okay. I'll be uh, bringing up two subjects. And in general, it's th on thoughts on architectural education. The first subject I'd like to speak about is on practice versus theory because I do think that that is the contradiction between educating and practicing. Theory in contrast to practice can strive to be pure. And I think it's hard to realize that sometimes. And we really try that uh, practice can be pure, it can be perfect, and it just can't be. Whilst uh, theory can be, and that's what it should be. And theory can touch perfection, whilst practice is made up of imperfections. And I think that's the beauty of practice, that it is in of architecture, that it is imperfect. But it should not be that much imperfect that it's wrong. So here really what's more beautiful, the imperfect Cycladic idol on the right 
or the perfect, let's say, classical sculpture on the left. I leave it up to you. I think there's a lot of beauty on the right, and that's what I'm trying to refer to in architecture. Theory is also independent of time. It can go on forever, it can perfect itself, it can be changed. Practice cannot. Practice in itself encompasses time. And I think that's a very, very important element of architecture. This is a project I did many years ago, I think back in 71. And the idea here was this is a building that could grow, could develop in time. Of course, it did to a certain extent, but it's more the theoretical part of it than the actual reality. But this, this uh, idea really reflects in the whole morphology of the building. Practice is site-specific. It belongs, I mean architecture, belongs to a place. In the end, it's there and it cannot move elsewhere. And there are many, many examples of very site-specific buildings. And I think the more site-specific a building is, most often it's better architecture. A well-known other example although it has many, many practical problems, maybe a bit due to the vanity of the creator, but it doesn't stop being one of the icons of modern architecture. Practice is also time-specific. It has a limit, it has a time, it has a limited time in which it has to be developed and uh, concluded. It c it's not open-ended. It is very, very time-specific, I said yesterday also, it reminds me, I mean architecture, or the practicing of architecture reminds me of a courier service. You have to deliver what you're going to do at a time, in a time, at a place, to a certain individual, and it can't be just delivered sometime to somebody. Practice also is unforgiving. Theory is not unforgiving, maybe it could be sometimes. But practice can be very, very unforgiving. And it depends if you don't take the proper precautions, it can really be very, very revengeful. On the education of the architect. Well, I think we all admit that architects have a split personality. Because we have one foot in technology and the other foot in art. And we really sometimes wonder which foot is the stronger foot and if one should be, again, uh, I mean, developed more than the other. I sincerely think it shouldn't. But that split personality certainly creates problems. And if it creates problems to, let's say, more mature uh, individuals, just wonder how many problems it creates to younger uh, people who do not yet have the experience. Architectural practice and education were always in conflict, right from the old times. And it was like that, and I think it still is like that. In ancient Greece, pedia was meant as the combination of both physical and intellectual exercise. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, and it's not so any longer. And by physical exercise, I mean really not necessarily exercising oneself, although that was how it started, but I mean but how one, execute, how one produces architecture, the whole process of, uh, of production. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it was Alberti who said that architectural design can be governed by theory because it can be related to ideal volumes. So was this, again, this practice, I mean, theorizing this practical aspect and giving an excuse why it could be governed by theory in a very intellectual, if you'd like, approach. Then, as a reaction to all this, the Académie de Royale d'Architecture was founded in 1671, the École Royale de Beaux-Arts in 1819, and these were reactions to the guilds that existed at that time. Because the guilds, which means the technological part or the technical part of it, were really dominating. And teaching started to be distanced from practice, just as it is today. 
Then came the Bauhauses, let's say, is a very, very simplified version of the development of architectural uh, education. But it's a Bauhaus which introduced a broader sense, but a much more abstract education, incorporating the other arts and giving emphasis to, uh, to architecture as part of a broader movement and of arts in general. We still continue today to have a bipolar system, theory and techniques, theory and technology versus composition. And that was like that, and I believe that the problem, I think Seamus touched on it previously, I think the problem is this bipolar attitude towards architectural education. And theory and composition are taught by different persons. I think that is also one of the problems. The student cannot make the correlation. He could not, in the end, really understand or realize that it's all in the one and the same. Composition devoid of practice. You have many, many times, and I'm, these are not, let's say, uh, I'm not ill meant to anybody who's practicing or teaching, but theory, uh, practicing, sorry, architectural education, studio work is very, very often done by people who have very little experience in practice. And as architecture is an applied art, you do have to have experience in practice also. It's not enough, of course. It's not everything. But it, I think it cannot just not exist. Architectural education needs much more than just skin-deep references. And very, time, very many times, what intrigues a student, who intrigues younger architects, is just what they see in magazines or even in, in reality. It's just the image, without really understanding what's going on behind. And I think if it's just the image which sort of fascinates you, I think it's just too skin deep. The teaching of theory must be incorporated, at least in my opinion, I don't think there would be many people who disagree with this, with studio work. The teaching of studio work should coincide with that of theory. Maybe in, for practical reasons, it can be separated at some times, but it's not just a switch on, switch off, let's say, procedure. You have the theory, you get the background, you get the technology, information, Sometimes that for younger students can be very boring or much less interesting and fascinating than the actual studio work. But it can't be that the student just switches off because he's maybe even allowed to do it like that. Just switch off and say, well, this doesn't interest me. Out of these, let's say, 100 issues, I'm interested in these five issues. The others can wait for the other project, for the other people who have the stupidity to be interested in all those other issues. It's not a switch on and a switch off procedure. And a lot of studio work, I believe, is exactly that. The teacher should have had adequate knowledge and technical experience. That, I think, is also necessary. And I think then there's a big dilemma at least back home, and I'm not involved in teaching, as I said, of whether the teachers should be practitioners or not, and how much they can spend their time between the two, or again, they have another split sort of personality, a split practical situation, and if they should be practicing, and then how much they could be teaching, how responsible are they when they're teaching, if their main concern is practice. But like in medicine, in other applied sciences, I do not think they could not be involved, they should not be involved at all. Or, and this is just a dig at some of the professors, of making use of this position of being teachers in order to enhance their practice. But that's, let's say, the practical problems involved. And one should remember, after all, that education is an ever-growing, evolving process. You never stop being educated. It's not just the first four years, five years, or six years, or whatever. It's an ever-evolving process. And I think maybe that's the most important message, that the beginning is so important, but it is only the beginning. Thank you very much.
you, Alex. It's really very difficult now to summarize the, uh, the CV of the next speaker, not just because of the quality, but uh, there's so many of uh, careers that he's uh, had successfully. And I'm talking about Professor Dean Hawkes, who um, <clears throat> has been a very influential teacher for now nearly 40 years, um, <clears throat> successful researcher for um, an equal amount of time, um, a practicing architect dedicated to the profession, and, uh, and also a very insightful um, author. Um, Dean taught at the Cambridge School of Architecture for about 30 years. Uh, several generations of uh, architects were inspired by his teaching and um, was the director of the Martin Center of uh, Urban and Architectural Research there. Sorry, Architectural and Urban Studies. Um, a research center that's uh, internationally known for its um, quality research and then um, was the professor of architecture at the Welsh School of Architecture in, um, in Cardiff. Um, if I can remember some recent books, uh, The Environmental Tradition, 1996, The Selective Environment, and then Architecture, Engineering and Environment, Dean Hawkes. You didn't tell me earlier. 93, but this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right, it's all right. Oh, my goodness. Simos, th th thank you very much. That was far too generous and probably inaccurate. Um, <laughs> because, um, because of this generosity, if I can get there, right. I'm a Mac user, so I'm f I, 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 I fumble when I get more than that. I should be okay from now on. Good. Yeah. I know about them. <laughs> um, I'm an architect, and I think that should be sufficient. Leslie Martin, who was my great mentor in, 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 in my work, um, once said architecture is a very big word, and I think that's a wonderful way of defining architecture. It covers many things. But I'm an architect who's, who's interested in words, and I'm interested in the way in which the words we use to talk about what we do are constantly in flux. And is that better? I'm not as tall as the other chaps. Um, um, and, and this word sustainability is, is, is in our lexicon, I think, our architectural lexicon, a very recent word. So I was kind of interested in, in, in it. And, I, and architecture or architectural in the title, I think I know what that means. And I think all of us know what it means. I think there would be a big overlap between our, our, our personal definitions of it. There would be differences, but there, there would be a considerable body of, of, of common ground. I'm also quite interested in notions of identity, so hence the title of this. I looked at my Oxford English Dictionary, my new Oxford English Dictionary, and looked at roots of words. Sustain, it's a verb, fundamentally. And I like the definition, strengthen or support. We all know what, and again, what sustainability in its current sense means. And so I don't think it's really worth kind of talking about it, but I'm interested in kind of what lies behind it. The notion of strength and or support seems to me to be very attractive when we're re referring to issues that concern us in architecture. And it's a very old word, as you can see from that definition, and it, its Latin roots come from sub, from below, and tenor, to hold. And identity, I like this. I was a bit dismayed when I first looked it up in my dictionary, but then I, I, I warmed to it. The fact of being who or what, what applies to a building or to architecture, a person or thing is. And then this second definition, the characteristics determining this. So what I want to try to do is to look at these issues of this, this question of sustainability from a very kind of long perspective. Um, and what I really want to suggest is that Whilst the word is new, the issues are very old. They run through architecture. They run through architecture from its origins. 
there are new urgencies and so on. But, 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 but I, 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 I want to suggest that if we take this long perspective on the issue, then many of the issues that Alex has just wonderfully elucidated for us of the connections between the parts begin to be solved or have the possibility to be solved. Um, there's another book in press um, called The Environmental Imagination. And this begins with this quotation from Louis Kahn, which I think is a wonderful quotation. It sums up, again, it, it addresses some of the things Alex has just been talking about, but it sums up my attitude to issues of techniques and their relationship to the deep issues of architecture. I wish that the first really worthwhile discovery of science would be that it is recognised that the unmeasurable is what they're really fighting to understand and that the measurable is only the servant of the unmeasurable that everything that man makes must be fundamentally unmeasurable. I like that very much. What I want to try to do <coughs> is, with this long perspective, is to suggest a kind of taxonomy of sustainable architecture. And, and th this, this is totally provisional, hence the word provisional. And there are, as it were, five bullets. There are many things that could be added to this. It might be... Uh, refined in many, many ways. And what I'm going to do is just show you a few buildings which correspond to these five categories of sustainable architecture. Um, the vernacular is something which often comes out in, in, in this discussion. And this is a, a house I discovered many years ago in, in not too far from Cambridge. Uh, it's a 15th century yeoman's house. And we're looking at it at the top from the north and we're looking at it from the bottom from the south. And just this question of the building rooted in its context, in its climatic context, is just so powerfully expressed by this astonishingly wonderful house. There is a sustainable building. It's been there since the 15th century, still lived in. Might consume a bit of extra energy in the winter, but if they've filled their loft with stuff and got a good boiler and controls, it should be actually pretty good, you know, and it's open to the south, admitting useful solar gains, all of that. It's a proto-passive house. The works of great architects, this is my category of the historical, and I'm only going to really show two historical examples, um, both from the Renaissance. The Villa Rotunda. If you read Palladio's Quattro Libri, you will read about the connection between his architecture and its context in the Veneto, the climate, the windows are size to provide enough light, to ventilate, to keep heat out. There's a whole series of those kinds of issues going on in this building. It's cross-sectional configuration with the principal habitable rooms sandwiched in the middle between the basement, a raised up basement full of thermal mass and the upper quarters which are servants. Servants are a kind of element of environmental management in, in the Renaissance view. You know, they can suffer the heat but the grand people don't. And this is a house, again, utterly, utterly, in my, in my broad definition, sustainable. There's much more we can say about it. A favourite building of mine um, is this fantastic house in the English Midlands, Hardwick Hall by Robert Smithson, which is also a Renaissance house. It's only 40 years after the Villa Rotunda. There was this marvellous moment in England when the, um, we had a, a, a Renaissance architecture that wasn't classical. That came later when people came back from the Grand Tours. But so this house is, and, and others like it have this astonishing kind of characteristics. But if you look at the plan, and sadly I, I, I've reproduced it the way it was in the book I took it from, north is to the left. Of course, north always should be up the plan on, on, on a representation of a building. Then you read it properly. But if you look at that plan, you see the main apartments on every level are at the south end. The north end has as it were, utility spaces, in Lucan's definition, service spaces, such as the kitchen, and I would define the chapel as a service space, um, at, at the north end. There's a most astonishing response to orientation in that incredible house, with its axis running north-south. Coming to modernism, and some people think that modernism isn't about um, anything that's sustainable, um, and in the research for my book, most of these buildings are in the new book, um, I looked at modernism, not strictly as sustainable, but as, but as, as envir an environmental proposition. And to some extent, I prefer the word environmental to sustainable. One, if you look at all of the, uh, the Le Corbusier's eight volumes, Oeuvre Complete, 
the Villa Savoie is drawn with the plan with south to the top, always. If you turn it round and draw it with north to the top, suddenly this is a beautifully orientated, engaged building. The main living space along the, 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 top, sp the, the, the top opens out the terrace, as that image down there shows. Um, the, 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 the covered loggia to the south you know, is it, it, beautifully orientated. The evening sun comes in. I mean, the, the, the whole series of things, you can reinterpret um, the, the modern movement in this way. I like the image of the bathroom, which with the roof light over the, over the tub and that view to the south down that long space, just, just the qualities of it. Um, many of you will know about the proposition of the other <coughs> tradition of modernism that Sandy Wilson, um, formerly my boss at Cambridge for many years, uh, ha has advanced. And the key figure in that movement is, is Alto. And Alto's own house, built in 1935 as the house and office. North is straight up on, the, on, 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 on these plans. Has this astonishing connection with, 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 with orientation, with the Finnish climate, with the dark winters, the long light summers. The whole of that south facade kind of steps back, creating a whole series of microclimates running from, uh, as you move back into the building. The sun shines in, that's an image of a living room. There's a brick wall with fire in it. It's, it, it's quite like that, 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 that house that, uh, that I showed at Great Waltham. Moving on to uh, probably Alto's greatest house, one of the great buildings of the 20th century, the Villa Maria. Um, the, the, the site plan has north more or less straight up. And if you study this building in depth, and one of my students has, has done some very detailed work on, on the solar geometry and the penetration of sunlight into this deep space. Again, it's most wonderfully adapted to climate. It creates astonishing um, um, environment for dwelling. And if you look at that upper, uh, the upper right-hand image, this whole facade is full of mechanisms and devices for regulating the relationship between inside and outside climatically. Not often seen in, in that respect um, in, in the book. Doing my research, I suddenly realized that there are buildings, relatively recent buildings, which actually adopt an incredible kind of notion of relationship between, oh, thank you so much, between um, architecture and environment and climate. And these are buildings that are, I've called the architecture of shelter. I discovered that there are modern buildings which have no heating system, no mechanical systems of environmental control whatsoever. Scarpa's astonishing Gyptoteca Canoviana at Passanio is one such. It has absolutely no heating. And as a result of that, I think it kind of engages it more deeply with the issues of climate and its context than a building where, the, in the architect's mind, there's the assumption that you will actually have those mechanical devices. As soon as you say, I don't need them, then you think about things in a much more fundamental, radical, and, and, and I think sensitive way. Another building that does exactly this is um, the Hamar Museum in, um, in, in Norway by Sfera Fenn. Again, a building with no heating systems, except for one tiny little part of it where some very precious artifacts have to be kept cosy in the winter. The building closes in September and opens in May, and it just protects its contents, these astonishing um, kind of folk art objects that come from um, that, 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 that region of Norway. It doesn't have electric light. It's kind of interesting. This astonishingly beautiful 14th century crucifix is in a top-lit, a top roof-lit little edicule of its own. And Fenn animates that by having permanent artificial light, just one tiny lamp which transforms the whole thing. If you study the plans of this building, you see how wonderfully it orientated it is. Working with an existing building, how the difference between north and south is absolutely fundamentally imagined. Um, Peter Zumthor's building over the Roman remains in Cor, um, again, has no mechanical system. It has some electric lighting, um, because occasionally people might go there after dark. But it consists of this wonderful timber frame skin with lamelli louvers covering it, and then this sequence of three big roof lights, which slope down 
to the north. In the, in the Zumthor books, incidentally, the north point is wrong. <laughs> it's a great pity. Um, but that image at the bottom left is taken in that building on a bright March day um, with no artificial lighting, no, 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 no flood lighting. The light comes in by into reflection through those timber louvers and the thing glows. And then you get this astonishing focus light through these great roof lights. And the two images on the right are the same roof light photographed within about five seconds of each other simply by looking in the other way, in the other direction. So the whole thing is kind of animated, bringing the, the, the qualities of, 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 of the ambient environment into this place. You're in there, you hear the wind, you hear the birds, you hear guys in a tire bay across the road, because the setting of this building is really quite strange. Um, you hear all of those things coming in. It's an astonishing kind of relationship. That, that and Sphere of Fens building and Scarpa's building are truly sustainable. They just stand there and, and, and shelter. Um, my last category is contemporary practices. And with a, a touch of vanity, I thought I'd just whiz by three of my own projects. Um, all of which address the environmental, energy, climatic questions of um, sustainability. One is a little direct gain, passive solar house in Cambridge. I put one image in specially for Alex. Um, um, the second from the left on the bottom is a painting by Alex, which I proudly display high in my kitchen where it looks wonderful. I'm troubled about the effect of, of, of the light on, on the red pigment, Alex, but I'll I'll install a blind, maybe. Um, I mean, the point is that this is a passive solar house. It costs just over £100 a year to heat. It's well insulated. Passive solar works. It's inhabited frugally. Um, but it's about bringing everything, all the elements together. And one of the great delights... This is my wife's house, so I live in it with her. Um, uh, one of the great delights of living in a building of this kind is that it's constantly changing. I have a digital camera, of course, and ev every day I almost I take a photograph. There's something new to see because of the animation that comes from this wonderful light. <coughs> this is a building I did about 11, 12 years ago. It's the Principal's Lodge at a college in Cambridge, and it had a hole in the middle. It had an open-to-sky courtyard, fully glazed on all four sides, and it was environmentally disastrous. So the college asked if I could find a solution to this. And I said, we'll put a roof over your courtyard. And the roof consists of cruciform structure with cl a clear street lit lantern with a solid ceiling. As a result of this, we hugely reduced the energy consumption of the building and transformed the environment, made it comfortable both in winter when it had been too cold before and in summer when it had been too hot before, and made them a space that they didn't ask for. And they now adore it, and they use it for recitals and all sorts of these grand pianos, a symbol of that. And finally, a project um, for an extension to a tiny cottage in Dorset. Um, the axonometric in, in, in centre um, shows, as a kind of wireframe, the original cottage, which was L-shaped. And what I did was to make a wall to the south, again, north is left, due south, made a wall and then built back between that wall and the existing house. And, be, and behind that made this grand living space, which is actually just a solar collector. It's an inhabited solar collector. We, we increased the floor area of the house by 80% and reduced its en overall energy consumption considerably. And that's a buffer space. It's an inhabited space. We improved the heating system. We um, put more thermal insulation into it. But the point really, the point of all, all of these examples is that by addressing these essentially technical questions from an architectural perspective with a sense of this long history of these issues being fundamental to making architecture, I think you continue to make architecture and, and maybe by example address some of those thorny problems that Alex was, 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 was mentioning in, in his contribution. My very last slide is just a proposition Sustainability in architecture is more than a matter of technology, sociology, or economics. It's all of those things. Of course it is, and one would be foolish to ignore them. But it's a deep, it is deeply embodied in the, in the history and culture of architecture, and it's found, and by other names, coming back to my interest in words, in most significant architecture. 
which means, of course, there's a lot of architecture which gets a lot of attention, which I don't regard as significant. Um, it's a manifestation of the architectural imagination, coming back to some extent to the title of the new book. It has to be a, an act of imagination which transforms the, the bald facts into architecture. And I think you have to, if you understand this, sustainable design will gain its place at the heart of the curriculum of architectural education. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Okay, you've um, already met the next speaker, Nikos Vindikakis. I introduced him then as the uh, director of the International Union of Architects Working Group on Architecture and Renewable Energy Sources. Um, I would like to introduce him also again now as, uh, as an architect based in Athens, uh, where he runs his practice synthesis and research a practice that uh, has been involved for many years in environmental research and, and building. <clears throat> uh, among the projects, one which I think he is likely to show us is this wonderful roof over the archaeological site uh, of Akrotiri on, on the island of Santorini in Greece. <coughs> Nikos Findikakis. The technology gets a little bit in time to come over, so we have to wait. Okay. Then, in idyllic Athens of the 5th century BC, while gazing out at the Aegean Sea, Aristotle codified the theory of the pre-Socratic philosophers on the value of the four basic elements, fire, air, water, earth, and the four basic qualities, warm, cold, dry, and wet. I shall try then very, very quickly to run with you some principal ideas, I should say spots, more or less, on how I have been educated and thus inspired by the Aristotle theory to create a, st a sustainable, more or less viable architectural design, leading to re-establish a friendly microclimate in our full of smoke and polluted environment through the sun, the air, the water, and the earth. I will present you very quickly four uh, projects on these elements. The notion of experiencing, of living, if you like, the built environment through the natural and the artificial events that form it 
led in the past to the formulation of the prevailing principles of architecture at various times. One of these principles, architectural principles, was and is the atrium through which from the ancient times was brought the sun and the air in the heart of the buildings. The Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki is a very characteristic example of the modern architecture of 1950. And I was asked to enlarge it, make it around double, for exhibiting the Macedonian gold and treasures that were found in 1970. The dominated designing tool here is the sun. Penetrate the building through the new pyramidal opening in the heart of the old museum, the atrium, and thus enters to the enlarged sections, which is underground, so does not affect the character of the building. The inclined roof, here you have the first sketches, the computer design, and then the reality. The inclined roof allows only the north rays of the sun to come in and closes by louvers the south rays. The windows open in the top of the pyramid and thus they create an air duct permitting the wind to flow all over the building. Simultaneously creates a transversal view between interior and exterior spaces, bringing the environment into the building. The next project is the Central Olympic Metro Station, which was also a pre-existing station. The needed enlargement was huge and should be also underground to unify the lower level, where was the level of the Olympic Stadium. The dominated element I used for the design is the air, the wind. The wind penetrates all the levels and refreshes the shadow provided through the roof leaves. The sun enters filtered by the leaves and special glasses under them prevent from the infrared and the ultraviolet radiation and create a very friendly microclimate with a sense of shadow under trees for the waiting passengers, especially during the hot August days. The louvers of the side fences conduct the fresh north wind in the low level, creating a complete air circulation. Then the colors reinforce the feeling of movement as well as the leaves, which are interwoven with the surrounding green. The next project is the Olympic canoe kayak and the element water which dominates this design. The architectural concept of the kayak installation creates the sense of a natural river running along the slopes of the hills of the surrounding environment. The 8,000 spectators are seated either in the grass or in wooden steps. Along the course of the river are wooden bridges reflected, reflected in the water, streams, a lake, gentle and steep passages, sorry, uh, uh, yes, and as well as open shaded spaces for the spectators. These special moving louvers create a feel of thermal comfort in the outdoor areas, especially under the summer sun. All necessary buildings were hidden into the hills and specially openings permit the cross air ventilation as well a view to the Saronic Gulf. And now, as Simos mentioned, I'm trying to give you the example of the Earth. It is to one of the eruptions of the volcano of Sandorini at the beginning of the late Bronze Age, around 
16th century BC that caused the submergence of a large part of the island and the burial of what remained under a thick mantle of pumice and the volcanic ash. This is a film taken in 1955, where was the last eruption of the volcano. You can imagine that the, the eruption of the volcano of the 16th century BC was 35 times more strong than this one. So then, a large city was buried. This is here, you see the site, as was before the start of the excavation in 1967 by Professor Marinatos. Then the continuation of the excavation to this day is done by Professor Christos Dumas. And here is the layer of ash. Here is from the discovered so you have, some photo, sorry, you have some photos of the excellent state of preservation of the ruins. You see here the squares, the building, the stairs. You see even water close. This is the second floor of a building. And there are four floors building remaining today. And here, photos from the unique works of art and the famous wall paintings that adorned the buildings. And here you have some photos from the abundant finds. You see this extravagantly curved table? It seems to me to be Victorian or prehistoric one. Beds and even snails, which were stuffed in yards. These photos are from today and uh, give the e existing image of the volcano, the caldera, and the layers of ash. This volcanic material, yes, started the moving, yes. This is a film that I've got it a week ago. This is the atmosphere in Sandorini. Okay. This volcanic material that at once destroyed but also protected for 3,500 years the ancient settlement, this was the plan of the ancient settlement, was a central tool for defining the philosophy of the design for the new sheltering, arrangement, protection, and enhancement <coughs> of this unique city. This design is based on all the four natural elements and provides the four qualities for the visitors, the cold during summer, the hot during winter, as well the dry and wet, depending the time of the day. The earth, is above the new shelter, arranged in arched sections with north and south openings, and provide the lost feeling of down and sunset in the buried city. The wind refreshed the air during night cross ventilation when the outside temperature drops down many degrees in comparison with the very hot midday. During day, the openings close and thus is kept the low night temperature, creating thermal comfort conditions for the thousands of visitors and archaeologists still digging there. Here you have the model and the pilot application. The shelter is designed in such a way that it does not violate the overall harmony of the area and is arranged as an extension of the surrounding configuration of the land curves. Here you have recent, three, four months ago, photos from the air where the inoxide shelter is already in place and ready to be filled with and covered by earth. These are the openings, the slit of openings from the north and in between them are the gutters for the water because we have to collect the rainwater there. 
The shelter is consisted of a space frame covered by inox metal sheets and on these are the waterproof membrane and the earth cover. The ceiling of the arched sections of the roof is wooden planks. The buffer zone between helps the abduction of the heat during day due to the visitors' exhalations of carbon dioxide. These are photos from the pilot application by which we control all systems and elements apply in the nearby real site. And because a sustainable design project has to find also sustainable methodology for constructing, I give you very few informations on how that is done. The space frame is supported by pillars and these pillars are situated in the same shafts that were the previous pillars from temporary deduction columns. We open then shafts, see here, about 18 20 to 25 meters depth in the bedrock. This is a unique golden ibex, the unique and the only one find it uh, during the excavations of the shafts. And then we have here a cross tomography of the ancient ground. And so we knew for the beginning where we could open the holes for the shafts. And now we have a complete and documented relief of this situation so many years ago. And so we explained the continuation of our culture. We opened holes in the pre-existing temporary shelter. You see here the transfer, the very, the very serious transfer and the, and the very dangerous transfer of the, and the placement of the reinforcement. The placement of the seismic insulators which permit the movement of the shelter for 30 inches that means that during next coming thousand years, whatever seismic happens do not, will not affect the, the antiquities. And uh, here you have the comparison of the old column and the new one. Here is the, f I'm trying to give you this, I don't know if that will work. Yes. You see the, the old, the new roof, this is the intermediate level for the protection of the antiquities during the construction phase. And uh, here is before the wooden plaques of the roof to be done. And, oh, sorry. Okay, and you see here the protection level, this is the old roof. This is the jail walls, the protection of the antiquities, the scaffold. And here you have the already done and finished, you will see later, uh, the perimetrical jail walls. And you see the starting of the positioning of uh, the truss. And here you have images that are some, some weeks ago. Everything is finished and now even everything is black waiting the earth cover to be filled in. And here you have an image generation through the computer of the site, how it was before and how it will be now. Sorry for that, I will try to give you a film also that one, yes. This is a film taken one, one week ago. You see the curves and the arches from the north to the south, and they are almost following the curves of the surrounding ground, and this level is the same level with right and left. So finally, there will be every invisible. So I would say that Aristotle, in his theory of the cosmos, the world, states that it is possessed by the influence of a nature that organizes everything in the most proper manner. Precisely this cosmos, with its mountains, its waters, its plants, 
the animals and of course humans became the most worthy subject of his theory by which the environment dominates architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. The, the, the next speaker, um, Owen Lewis, trained as both architect and engineer. Um, in 1975, he founded the Energy Research Group at the University College of Dublin. Um, ERG, as many of you will probably know, became internationally known over the years for its uh, publications, research, consultancy, and also as an organizer of many um, events uh, on behalf of the European Commission. And uh, since then, uh, Owen Lewis uh, became Professor of Architecture at the University College Dublin and is now the, the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture. Owen. Thank you so much. Would you be able to? Sure, I can find it. Morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, maybe more particularly on the architectural education uh, aspects and, and try and address some of the uh, issues that um, Simos highlighted at the, at the beginning. Um, and I'll use uh, some examples um, uh, with some particular focus on my own uh, school. Not that it is in any way exemplary, but I think it provides some uh, illustration of one approach. Um, the, the background uh, to this is uh, where I can. Where was that? Uh, oh, there it is. Um, the background, as with uh, m uh, the, uh, many of the other speakers, I won't attempt uh, definitions of sustainable architecture, but to to identify some of the of the scope of that are, are listed uh, issues ranging from uh, environmental uh, matters through materials and embodied energy and so on th and conservation uh, through also the use of our of our building stock and so as uh, as Dean noted uh, um, uh, issues which are site specific and of course uh, design oriented some of the issues that where knowledge would be uh, would be required and where in some ways we can see literal uh, issues in modern buildings, this by Peter and Mary uh, Doyle, uh, an interpretive center in the south of, of Ireland. One of the key central issues, I think, in this whole agenda is, is, one, uh, is the notion of looking at the life cycle of the building, something which is so foreign uh, uh, to often to our clients as well as to our, uh, as to our colleagues where so much of the emphasis is on, is on this little bit um, uh, that appears above water and that we uh, fail to take any full account of the matters that arise through the life of the building and that, of course, a central, a central issue here. Uh, Brian, um, <laughs> the uh, Queen's Building, I think, is that right? Uh, um, in De Montfort University. The, uh, but another contrast in the professional sphere uh, against what is still in many ways the um, conventional approach, relying on engineering systems to repair the deficiencies in the envelope which we as architects have designed, and contrasting that with an approach which emphasizes integration, which emphasizes uh, a ho uh, synergies. Um, I also want to, to note 
that much of our work has uh, focused, most, much of our community's work, I think, has focused uh, on uh, the new buildings, has relatively neglected uh, the existing and also the scale beyond the individual building. And I just note the, the, Portu the um, Swedish and Portuguese uh, examples of, of uh, people who are trying to address uh, other, other scales. In uh, UCD, um, what's done at the moment um, has evolved from uh, a course which was entitled uh, Ecology and Architecture and which had two strands, one which is really about uh, conservation and was rooted in a strength in the school in the uh, study and research in uh, architectural conservation and the other uh, which was rooted in the uh, area of environmental and energy issues. I know just part of the sustainability agenda but then there are practical issues which reflect that. Our work, uh, uh, my work in this area has reflected the lack of institutional and national resources and some uh, opportunities which we were able to realize from European resources and which were funded through energy programs, energy research programs, um, which I think um, partly explains uh, some of the emphasis. But in uh, first year where these issues are now uh, introduced in, in my school, um, uh, in courses uh, in which I'm not uh, now directly involved, um, architecture and the environment where there's an emphasis, uh, as, I suppose, on the relationship uh, between uh, the, the natural and the built environment and so on, and the whole context of, of sustainability introduced in, uh, uh, along with site ecology and the vernacular and many of the themes which have been uh, identified earlier. Um, uh, the vehicle of a tool, and I'll be talking about, about tools a fair amount, um, but Ecotech is the software which is uh, the, to which the students are introduced and which they will use in, in uh, later uh, years. For instance, in, in second year in environmental science uh, courses, where there is a more detailed study of the building uh, and its environment in, in, some, in some detail. So looking at issues like comfort and heating and cooling and lighting and ventilation, acoustics and so on. Um, so the design emphasis is something which maybe is, is a little unusual in, in my school in that there are very few um, uh, full-time members of staff and the school is almost uh, entirely, it's predominantly taught by uh, practitioners, by architects in, in practice. Um, and that has some, some bearing on how the, the teaching uh, occurs. Um, the project-based uh, learning is, is important in the, in the UCD school and so Ecotech is used to examine um, building performance, um, uh, sometimes in parallel and uh, other times using uh, student uh, projects. I in third year, where some of the uh, themes to which I uh, referred originally, the ecology of architecture, uh, these, these are, are brought up and, and there is something of the, uh, the wider implications of sustainability is, is an important part here. Um, the uh, bioclimatic design and uh, the social, political and material consequences um, of, of our work as, as architects. So you, the three units are highlighted here, the uh, resources, uh, the environmental design and assessment, so looking at some of the uh, methodologies used here, and also uh, some concern on, on perception and uh, the human senses. The fourth year, and I promise this is the last of these uh, text-rich um, uh, PowerPoints that, which I'll burden you with. Uh, here there are uh, lecture courses which uh, uh, in our fourth year programs there's more of a professional emphasis and so um, a, a concern to give uh, the students some of the, of the tools uh, which they may be able to use in practice and also an, a, an attempt in a, a second part of the program to, a, to give some options to the, school, to the students which they might explore in some greater detail, some special topics uh, which reflect some of the uh, research interests uh, uh, in, in the school. And so uh, the example uh, noted there is performance analysis uh, methods. Now, I say a little about background to some of this work because um, 
uh, numbers of people in this room have been involved in, in the European work to which uh, Simos referred. And uh, one of these, I, I think, I, I mentioned uh, two of these international initiatives. Uh, one was something to which um, uh, Simos, uh, we referred as the Valley Sets, uh, which was uh, um, under the Herd's uh, team uh, at uh, Architecture Climate, Simos here at the AA and ourselves in Dublin, um, developed uh, resource packages, multimedia resource packages, which went out to, which were delivered to every, every school, I think, uh, at the time in, in the then uh, European Union. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little unsure whatever happened to them, but uh, they were gratefully received uh, at the time, and uh, numbers of inquiries for uh, further uh, copies come up from, still from time to time. Um, across the Atlantic, the Americans did something, um, and I'm sorry, my uh, uh, images here don't, uh, haven't, haven't transferred from the Macintosh to the PC, um, but the Vital Signs Initiative was another uh, curriculum um, initiative, which, in fact, it, it uh, continues, and it has some interesting features. Um, it, of course, didn't have one of the challenges which we faced, and that was working in uh, 11 languages, or delivering material uh, to a community which was multilingual. And that, I think, enabled them to uh, have a, a, a considerably greater depth in the uh, technical content of the, of the material. But I think they did something else which uh, has influenced me quite a bit, and that is the development of the instrumentation package, which has become an important part of the way in which this uh, initiative has, I think, influenced American architectural education. But another strand of this uh, complex picture the notion of ideas competitions, which were used in the European research programs now, not in dissemination activities or whatever, but in research programs, and which I think had an interesting relationship with the development of research uh, issues. In this case, uh, this was uh, at an early stage in European work on uh, daylighting. Uh, in this case, it was natural ventilation. And in this case, um, one which has, I, I think, not progressed in anything like uh, the uh, fruitfulness to which these two areas progressed, and that was in the rehabilitation of, of uh, particularly large panel buildings uh, with an emphasis on what are now the new member states of the, of the Union. But these bringing the researchers um, and educationalists um, together with uh, some very distinguished uh, architects uh, were, I think, I important uh, influences in the development uh, uh, of the research program, certainly, and hopefully had some impact on uh, architecture as well. There are a lot of uh, resources out there, and I highlight just one, which, is, um, uh, which, has found, uh, which had a different target audience, but has found use in architectural education. This was an initiative to provide uh, resources for people involved in mid-career education. So it was something designed to be delivered to educationalists and um, um, CPD people in the particularly professional uh, institutions, um, but in fact has found a fair bit of application in, in some architectural uh, institutions. And the uh, authors are, are noted there. But the kind of thing, again, it's, it's technical. Uh, the emphasis is technical here. So there's quite a lot of, pub, uh, of material here which is published uh, only on the, in, on the internet, maybe uh, close to 1,000 uh, pages of, of material which can uh, be downloaded in individual units on, uh, as PDF uh, documents. And a number of uh, case study modules as, long as, as well as instructor modules and some software and so on. Um, an example of one of the very many resources which are accessible on the internet. I see uh, an, a new portal site being, being developed uh, there. This is a somewhat older one, the European Green Building Forum, uh, a portal with an emphasis on, on, I suppose, European sites, but a way to get at uh, the very considerable uh, work which has been done. Ah, dear, another um, uh, failure to transfer. And uh, so I'm noting, for instance, and maybe Sue, you'll talk about the teaching and architecture initiative, um, the, the work done, uh, being done by the, uh, the American-based Society of Building Science Educators, and uh, 
the image was of this amazing uh, current competition which is going on in the United States among students of architecture where they are challenged to build uh, a house, a low energy house, which will be moved in the autumn of this year uh, to the mall in Washington and will be lined up along each other. It's the advantage of building in timber, uh, I suppose. Uh, it's a pity the image didn't, uh, didn't transfer. Um, I've mentioned uh, several um, several families of tools, and I, I, I want to note the current uh, European programs which allowed the development of, of some of the tools and have been useful in, in providing uh, support uh, for uh, some of these initiatives which have uh, benefited architectural education. Old series of programs in Altener and SAVE and uh, various programs, uh, rather fewer in FP6, but in the Energy Framework program, uh, some of these. And these are part of the European commitment to transform uh, um, the energy performance of our building stock. I want, just before concluding, to touch on one which, uh, in architectural education, I think uh, we, we may not, if you like, in the studio, be paying much attention to yet, but I think we'd all be aware of, is going to be an important driver in um, in providing new roles within the construction industry. Um, whether architects choose to, to seize some of these opportunities, um, for instance, 8,000 of our colleagues, uh, uh, professional architects in Germany, are now registered as unemployed. Um, this directive, which uh, is to be implemented in uh, all of the member states on the 4th of January next year, will call for some, uh, the creation of some thousands of, of uh, jobs to implement the directive because it involves a whole lot of certification, inspection of buildings and so on. Whether architects who I believe have the best training to take the, the broad view which is required to, to transform, the, to, to implement this directive, whether the architects choose to seize that opportunity or whether we will leave it to another uh, engineering profession to come, come forward and, and take this oppor uh, opportunity uh, remains, to be, remains to be seen. Um, I finally uh, touch on a, an issue which I uh, mentioned earlier, which has impressed me in some of the American work which I've been able to see uh, in education, and that is this use of, uh, of the hands-on, encouraging the students to get some uh, first-hand experience uh, with some uh, quantitative basis of what these environmental parameters mean. This is a new institute in our, in our uh, faculty, Urban Institute Ireland, and one of the nice things, apart from some environmental um, uh, awareness in the building, is that it provides us with a lot of uh, tools. It is a research instrument, but it's, it's being influential in the teaching as well. Uh, Paul Kenny, who's a, a key person in the teaching now, shown there in uh, the weather station, there's a hemispherical skies, a lot of instrumentation, thermographics, and so on. And uh, it's, it's very useful for the students to get that uh, sense of being able to examine a building uh, where either good or bad qualities can also be translated into, into quantitative terms, and I think that that's uh, rather valuable. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Owen. Next speaker, Susan Rauf, is a professor of architecture at Oxford Brookes University. Sorry? Um, she's um, <clears throat> the architect and owner of the Oxford um, Eco House, or Solo House and um, the author of many books, including um, Eco House One, which has now become, I think, Eco House Two, and um, Adapting Buildings and Cities for Climate Change, and many others. She, um, uh, coincidentally, she studied here at the AA in this, um, what I think I would call as the heroic, heroic period of the mid-1970s when we had this unit 
called um, Rational Technology Unit, uh, run by Jerry Foley and George Kasapov. Uh, so. Thanks very much, Thomas. Could I have these lights off here? Is that possible? Yeah, brilliant. Well, what we've seen so far is a rather comfortable view and a lot looking backwards. What I want to do today is to talk about the vision of solar cities, look forwards, and it's not very comfortable. And although we, um, I'm focusing it in this first slide on historic Oxford, um, I think the future is perhaps going to be less enjoyable than we'd like it to be. You see, for millennia we have lived in sustainable low energy buildings powered by the sun largely around the world adapted by local cultures to local climates and landscapes, enabling us to choose as we live. And there is a phenomenal amount of um, ingenuity in the technologies employed. This is the ice houses, and here on the bottom right, you see the ice pans of the Knickerbocker Glory Company outside, Washing, uh, outside Boston, where they exported ice all around the world to fill the tables of the London salons as well. And then in the hot deserts, we had this amazing technologies where you could, when it was 35, 45, 50 outside, <coughs> you could be perfectly cool and comfortable in basements, in beautiful buildings. And even, even in tents, by simple manipulation of sort of covers and materials, people could live in tents from the equator to the Arctic with the ingenuity of the way we use things and the understanding of how people adapt physiologically to different climates. Because you see, the modern engineering, the Western engineering view of architecture and buildings where people can only be comfortable in temperatures from 22 to 24 degrees centigrade or around there, is so fundamentally and profoundly wrong. It's a psychology and a philosophy that's been developed to promote nothing more than the well-being of the machine. In fact, people can actually adapt across a huge variety of temperatures, and you can see people can be thermally comfortable or neutral from 16, 18 to 38 and 40 degrees centigrade. But even that's in the traditional history of the world. But you see, everything is different now because we are now in the 21st century, and things are changing fast. Buildings are changing. Climate is changing. The 90s was the warmest decade on record, and I, I won't, you'll all know about, you'll all know about climate change, I'm sure, how the predicted temperature increases are being so closely followed by the actual measured temperature increases. And on every climate, on every continent, the climates are changing catastrophically. In Antarctica, the ice is melting, and you say, so what, Larsen B. ice shelf goes. But this is a type of force and a phenomenon that respects neither rich nor poor. No one is safe in a gated community from climate change. It's affecting all of our lives now. For instance, two million people in 2007 in Britain may not get insurance on their homes. <coughs> that means that people in the floodplains now, the single most important investment you make in your life you possibly will not be able to ensure. And we all know that what's causing climate change is the rising um, greenhouse gas emissions. And what's causing that, 50% of what's causing it, is buildings. You know, the buildings that we design and live in and use. Well, we're trying desperately, in the face of challenges of like controlling the climate, to put into place um, various targets where between now and 2100, the um, targets of reducing down to 20, 80% less use of energy, 80% less use of carbon, it's a nice idea and Kyoto is definitely a step on the right road. But in between now and then, we have other phenomena which might actually make it possible. Things like the phenomena of peak oil. We are now globally just about the peak of the known reserves of oil outputs here. And from now on, oil outputs are going down from this year. 
and yet in the face of global increases in demand. And here in that centre bit, we're looking at real economic, fairly catastrophic uh, breakdown of Western approaches. And you say, I'm over-egging over the pudding. This is New York, July 2003. The lights are already going out. And we are actually living in an age, at the beginning of the age of dark cities. <laughs> and many people in the developing world will know very well what it's like to live in cities without um, power. So things are changing fast. For reasons of climate change, fossil fuel depletion, a number of us are increasingly seeing the future, on a larger scale, the future, not comfortable survival or pretty buildings or... It's about survival now, in a way. And one of the units of survival we see as the solar city. And a lot of the smart money is already going into solar cities. This isn't India, unfortunately. India's got very few panels, except near the presidential palace. But here in China, where there is a huge realization that they simply do not have the energy left to um, power their development, they're moving whole scale. This is Kunming into solar systems for all their buildings. And America, too. San Francisco is putting 50 megawatts of PV on their buildings. Barcelona now has laws where every new building has to have solar panels on it. Well, how does that relate to comfortable Britain in temperate northern Europe? Well, in Oxford, we started some years ago. We created a target. We wanted 10% of all our buildings to have solar energy on by 2010, um, to capacity build local government, to establish strategic alliances that might make the solar dream happen, and to initiate and implement solar businesses. And this means that the architect, the planner, it's joined up thinking it's not about architecture anymore. It's about making the future hap ha happen and survivable. So rather than architects retreating more and more and more into being uh, fashion icons or gurus, we have to go back out into local government, into business, into citizens' organizations, work with planning, work with real targets, and work with business to develop and enable a new age where the buildings that we do build in the future run on clean, renewable energy. This means we'll probably develop solar rights, solar ordinances. We're looking at actually making our city a unit for trading on carbon trading scales. And we're developing the models whereby we can look at um, individual ordinary houses and see how we can reduce emissions from them and make as much of the building energy come from clean renewable energy as possible. And the nice thing is that local residents want it. And when I say residents, I'm talking about clients. So we get a lot of people who want new buildings and they want it solar. It's getting quite a role on here. So we're building a client base there. So it's business for us too. They actually want it. And we've done a number of feasibility studies. And people are getting excited. We've got the <coughs> streets vying to be the first solar street in Oxford where 10% of the houses have solar panels on them. And then we'll move up to look at all the infrastructural issues of getting solar suburbs, like developing microgrids. And there's an awful lot of money involved in this, and there's an awful lot of business. So we've got GIST-based models whereby we can tell what every house is like, the press of a few buttons, what it has to do to reduce its emissions, and we're setting targets emissions for every building. So every time you've got a new building with a target emission, that means something has to be done. So it's work for architects. Hey, what can we do? And we're going out into the streets to sell this idea. So what we want to do is to show that the historical city of Oxford can lead cities around the world into the future um, with the solar cities idea and stimulate local business, stimulate local economies because what we're doing with our architecture is building the low carbon economies of the post fossil fuel age. And what you'll find in the next few years is it's not decades away, it's years away. 
And if we don't wake up to the challenge of creating it, um, then it's simply not going to happen and we're going to suddenly get a, a catastrophic stop of the 20th century dream. What we have to do is build the reality of 21st century survival, um, survivable communities. And I'm not sort of just one voice talking off the wall because what we had in the first international congress for solar cities was 20 mayors from 20 cities, what, Beijing, San Francisco, Daegu, Barcelona, whatever, 20 cities. This time in 2006, we're going to hold the second international solar cities congress in Oxford. Um, and you're all welcome to it. We hope to have 100 mayors from major cities, largely from Europe, that is a hundred potential clients for solar buildings. So mayors, citizens, scientists, we're going to have so scientists, we'll put the architecture, the planning in there. We bring everybody together and that's business, you know, and that's part of making it happen. We're going to have um, 2nd of April 2006 to the 6th of April 2006 and we really want architecture to be right in there and the in International Institute of Architects we're discussing this morning about the possibility of having a solar buildings exhibition. And we've got a website that's going to be up and running next week. So we want to use the wisdom of the past to build the cities of the future. It's not about the capitalist dream of the 20th century, which is really past now. The images, the icons, the paradigms are gone. <coughs> it's a new age and a new form of settlement in which technologies become, solar technologies become part of the architecture and they become part of the way in which we can easily, and we already are, um, reducing down to 10, 20% of what buildings run on. And we're doing it, if only we could see these solar elements is just an integral part of the ordinary way we build. Because solar cities and renewable energy cities are inevitable. If we're to steer the super tanker of our society away from the storms ahead, or if we cannot afford to, and this is an actual picture of a super tanker where the owners of this super tanker said, I'm so sorry, we can't afford the petrol, you're going to have to go through that. We have to at least learn how to batten down the hatches if we are actually to survive the next hundred years. So we need bright ideas. We need to make sustainability happen very fast. It's not a comfortable concept anymore. And we have to eliminate risk. Everybody in their brave new world of the 1960s said, we'll pull down the old cities, we'll make great new concrete cities. We're pulling them down now. We're pulling down buildings that are 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old. We can't afford to make those mistakes again. We need robust, resilient buildings if we're to survive. We've got the technology to know how to do it. We've got brilliant things like the internet. It is a very big idea. But I think we've got the skills level to do it. But don't think it's all going to be comfortable like before, because it, it's a new world. And we look at the historic buildings that developed all around the world, these comfortable buildings that year on year on year become more and more profligate with the very high um, prestigious buildings that we see all around us now in cities that are not only horrible to be in, but they're completely unsustainable. There is a future, but it's a new way of building and it's a new approach to building. And we have one generation to make it happen. That's why we'd like to invite you all to become part of the Solar Cities movement and join in on the inevitable benefits for all of us of making sure that Solar Cities happen. Thank you very much, and anybody who's interested. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. 
Well, the next speaker, Dr. Thanos Stasinopoulos, um, is an architect, practicing architect in Athens and uh, a teacher at the uh, Department of Architecture of the National Technical University of Athens. He um, has also spent some time uh, here with us at DAA in, in the mid-1980s when he followed our courses in the AA Graduate School and um, is a frequent visitor to our program and also a regular host uh, in Greece when we uh, uh, take our nice trips, uh, some of which on the island of Santorini. In fact, I need to say as many good things I can about him because we do hope to go back uh, this year. Thanos. Well, in fact, my presentation uh, somehow continues where the previous one <laughs> stopped. Uh, perhaps I should uh, explain. Oh, perhaps I should explain the title a bit. Um, well, it's a metaphor. Uh, I'm thinking about us, about mankind, as a kind of uh, vessel. It's just one vessel and all the mankind is on it, whether first class or business class or economy class. We are all on the same boat. And uh, we're floating on a kind of environment, which sometimes is calm, sometimes is not. And there are other creatures underneath or above us. And uh, while we sail in that environmental sea, uh, there are dangers lurking underneath or somewhere, a kind of uh, reef which is hidden somewhere, and it might be very dangerous. So, um, up to now, our mainstream models that we have in architecture are buildings like that, let's say monuments of the existing uh, social and economical system somehow. And that's what we try to imitate in uh, our projects. But in spite of this uh, bright lights atmosphere, uh, there are more things around us that uh, hide all these sparkling lights. And uh, I don't want to repeat what the previous speaker said, but uh, and there are many dangers, many reefs around us. Uh, this is a collection of those uh, reefs we have to face. Uh, I started with energy, like uh, most of our speakers here, but it, it's not just energy. Even if we have, with cold fusion, uh, say, abundance, an abundance of energy, still we're going to have problems with other environmental issues like water, etc., etc. Now, what is the response of uh, architecture in uh, uh, facing these problems? Uh, well, I would say something like that. We continue uh, designing buildings that do not really relate to all those reefs that lie ahead. Uh, you can say that we ignore all the coming problems and we continue design uh, with style and fashionable, fashionable way, uh, like adding to the general celebration that exists around us without thinking about the future. Now, uh, I don't want to generalize any further. I just want to convey my experience from my school in Athens uh, where sustainable design is not really first place. In fact, it's, it might be the last place of uh, uh, concern in the school. And uh, there are certain good reasons for that, and this is a list of uh, 
at least I think most of these reasons. First, uh, students have uh, other paradigms to imitate because uh, architecture is conveyed through imitation. So students have big stars to uh, uh, imitate as their examples. And uh, the result of that is that uh, uh, most of the attention is focused on 2D uh, ideas instead of uh, material things or matter, and that in 4D, which means except uh, uh, besides space, uh, X, Y, Z, then we, we should add time. And this is something that uh, seldom happens, at least in my school. And then uh, generally, uh, sustainable design or bioclimatic design uh, is approached in a quantitative manner, uh, which is not very uh, appealing to architects. Uh, uh, architects prefer less numbers and more uh, images, perhaps, uh, or other things than numbers. And uh, as a result of that, at least the way in my school, again, uh, the bioclimatic design is, pre is presented, uh, students are not very much attracted by that uh, quantitative approach. Uh, and, and they believe that uh, that uh, kind of architecture uh, has uh, very few things to do with actual design. Now, another obstacle comes from the fact that uh, the curriculum uh, is directed, of course, by the old guard of the professors. And uh, uh, they don't really have much experience uh, about uh, uh, bioclimatic design. And uh, they view that with a kind of suspicion. Uh, they don't really know what it is about, uh, and they try to put it aside uh, as much as possible. And it's not just uh, bioclimatic design that creates that kind of fear. Uh, it's also the introduction of uh, computers that uh, most of the old guard uh, feel some fear about. Uh, and at the same time, even the younger staff uh, doesn't have enough uh, training so uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, lack of staff to introduce bioclimatic and environmental issues to the curriculum. Still, uh, there are some classes uh, referring to that, but these are just elective courses uh, without any design or studio work. It's just lectures, and uh, as such, uh, it's a kind of it's a kind of theoretical issue that doesn't really attract many student, many students, and uh, it has created a kind of uh, fringe name in the school that these uh, classes are uh, about a kind of fringe architecture. Uh, and all those um, environmental uh, global issues that uh, you're aware of, I, I guess, uh, are not really discussed in, my, in our school. Uh, there is little discussion or perhaps a general awareness about those problems, so uh, architecture is uh, business as usual uh, most of the time, uh, simply because nobody talks about uh, all those uh, elements of the environmental crisis and uh, about the future, in fact. And then again, even if some students do like to know more about it, uh, there are certain things missing from the curriculum, like uh, uh, courses about building physics, uh, about environmental technology, about things that uh, would help them to um, incorporate some of their environmental concerns into their own design. Now, this was about the in-house problems, but it's not just inside the school that there are uh, problems about introducing the notion of sustainability in architecture. Uh, and the first reason, in my opinion, is it, it comes from a, a vague um, a quality that uh, uh, environmental design has. Uh, is it uh, just a technique that we can apply to any kind of uh, architecture? Uh, is it a, a style by itself, a green style of architecture, like postmodernist or, you know, you know all those different architectural uh, styles names? Or is, or is it a, a kind of uh, way of thinking, a, a kind of mentality that uh, uh, dictates architecture 
whether it is uh, technology or layout or the whole philosophy behind buildings. And uh, besides that vague identity, you also have a vague objective. We're talking about sustainable design, sustainability, etc. All right, we're trying to sustain something. What's that something? Are we trying to sustain our way of living today? Are we trying to sustain our consumerist uh, addiction? Are we trying to sustain the current political system? What? Then uh, another fact that goes beyond the schools is that, uh, at least in the West, society is uh, used to that euphoric consumerism that surrounds us through advertisements and the everyday way of living that we're accustomed to. And given that atmosphere of, of wealth, then you can't really expect from students to think that in 20 years perhaps uh, this way of living would be passed. Uh, but still, today it's present and that hides what could happen in the future. And from many directions, uh, I hear comments about the aesthetics of green design, of uh, bioclimatic design. Mm, bioclimatic buildings uh, are ugly. Or I had a, a question recently by a student. Um, all right, I'm, uh, I do care about uh, environmental uh, aspects. But uh, what about uh, the issue of aesthetics in my building? I do care about aesthetics as well. We'll be able to combine that. Or uh, do I have to sacrifice one for the other? Uh, so uh, my response is a long story. But anyway, uh, there is that issue of aesthetics, which for some people is a negative aspect of uh, environmental buildings. Then uh, facing all these environmental problems, uh, the general approach is a kind of behavior which I call the ostrich syndrome, that we ignore those problems. We don't want to see them. And in that way, we feel safe. Uh, so students don't want, perhaps, even if they uh, imagine uh, the dark future, uh, they don't want to, to face it. They, pretend to, they prefer to, to see bright today. And then again, there's the, the final uh, thing, we, we talk about sustainability, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, it's not really quite clear what we're trying to sustain. And also it's not clear uh, what the price of sustainability will be. And uh, what I mean by that is simply, for example, that we will, be, we will be forced to sacrifice some of the things that we're accustomed to today, like our uh, two or three mobile sets, or our power-hungry uh, SUVs, or our big houses, or things like that. Uh, we do have to sacrifice some things. And if it, is, if it is not our comfort, then in that case, we should sacrifice uh, some uh, 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 ideals we might have about, let's say, democracy, about uh, equality uh, for all, etc., etc. Because the planet cannot uh, sustain all of us with the same standard of living and the same political system. I can't imagine, for example, uh, China and India having the living standards of California and the planet being safe at the same time. So we have to reduce some things in order to get what we call at the end a sustainable human society. Now, um, I described some kind of uh, obstacles earlier, uh, at least in my school, and I believe that it's not just my school. I hear lots of good things happening in Dublin, uh, uh, but I don't believe that uh, uh, the Dublin example is uh, something very common around the, the globe. On the contrary, I do believe that Athens School uh, is more typical of the kind of uh, uh, architectural approach. So what I would suggest that uh, could uh, promote the architectural, the sustainable architecture in uh, my school and many other schools, we would first to, to promote among students uh, the, some kind of uh, awareness, some uh, uh, motives or motivation to deal with those uh, 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 environmental things. And at the same time, of course, uh, give them the ability to tackle those uh, uh, aspects. 
And uh, in order to do that, uh, we could have uh, some events that promote uh, the issue, like lectures, exhibitions, and visits. We could also have uh, some uh, workshops and seminars uh, in cooperation perhaps with uh, uh, more than one school. Uh, we could have uh, student competitions, and it's a pity that uh, those uh, student competitions organized by the EU uh, are not that frequent. Uh, I would like very much to see more, perhaps on an annual base. Uh, then we might uh, try to, exp to uh, exploit uh, the power of the Internet and have some uh, dynamic sites promoting issues, perhaps presenting uh, 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 what go is going on in Europe on that issue, a kind of uh, uh, the AA events list, uh, uh, the weekly events list. We could have that in the Internet, a kind of, as I said, dynamic presentation of uh, uh, the field. Oh, sorry. Water, please. Some water. Um, in the meantime, uh, the, uh, thank you. Excuse me. And um, in parallel to those efforts, uh, of course, uh, the school has to review its curriculum, uh, uh, blending the new uh, issues into normal design courses, and uh, uh, also perhaps uh, add uh, uh, those uh, missing uh, uh, classes like uh, building physics, etc. But this has to be performed in, uh, in a uh, holistic manner, uh, not just uh, adding bits and pieces uh, in a shed-like uh, situation. Uh, this is very important, otherwise you're going to have again the fringe reputation. And at the end, uh, perhaps we should start thinking that uh, what we're talking about as a sustainable architectural design, uh, perhaps it's a mistake to uh, think that it's uh, architecture as it's been up to now. Uh, I have uh, added this biotextural uh, term, which unfortunately it's not the original one, but it refers to other kinds of buildings. But anyway, if we distinguish between the architectural and the biotextural department, perhaps we would be uh, closer to uh, our target as, uh, uh, sustain as uh, the, the target we describe as sustainable architecture. And uh, that's it. I have some uh, text here, but it's perhaps it's too long for me to repeat it. I only want to underline the text on the top right. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Thanu. <coughs> The, the final speaker of this morning session is um, Dr. Adrian Pitts. He's a senior lecturer in, in, in energy environment and sustainability at um, the University of Sheffield uh, School of Architecture. Um, his um, most recent book, Planning and Design Strategies for Sustainability, and interestingly enough, for profit. Um, just two months ago, he um, um, hosted a, um, a meeting of people, um, educators in uh, sustainable architecture uh, in Sheffield. And um, I'm looking forward to, um, to see the kind of uh, discussions that they had there as well. Uh, thank you for those uh, kind words, uh, Seamus. Uh, I don't know whether this is the uh, best slot or the worst slot just before lunch. Um, those of you who've looked at the programme will realise that I'm not Sue Rove. Uh, Sue has to uh, dash off, so uh, she asked if we could uh, swap positions. Um, 
First of all, a couple of apologies. Um, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment. Those in the front row should be worried. Those further back perhaps not so worried, but I might not be in quite the same sparkling form as I sometimes are. Uh, and I also apologise for the uh, lack of images of beautiful buildings that so many of uh, my colleagues seem to have shown. I think the most bright thing you'll see here today is my Homer Simpson tie. Um, I've still got a few more hairs than Homer Simpson, but being Red Nose Day, I thought it was an appropriate uh, addition. Um, first of all, just to, to kind of set the scene, I'm not an architect. My background is as an energy engineer. And as many people, I think, found themselves over the last 15 years or so, that they began their interest in what is now called sustainability through an interest in energy and environment. And the title of my talk is Sustainable but Not Autonomous in Relation to Architectural Educators. I think what this uh, represents is actually a change in emphasis uh, in the kinds of things which uh, people are interested in. Not autonomous, uh, single uh, subject material, but in fact uh, sustainable, holistic types of material. Um, uh, one of the reasons for being here today is uh, because of my involvement with a group called the Educators for Sustainable Architecture. I'll be talking about that uh, in a few moments' time. Uh, first of all, though, perhaps to set some kind of context, ask a couple of questions and uh, maybe set the scene in respect to a, a few things that I want to cover. First of all, in terms of the context of sustainability and architectural education, I think these days uh, we recognise that the old kind of paradigms where we might have been influenced mainly by environmental concerns are rather too narrow now. We have to extend into the areas of economic and indeed social areas of uh, sustainability, including equity and well-being. Um, but there are another number of other factors that need to be thought about. Uh, there's a deal of in confusion, in fact, I think, over whether when we're looking at sustainability we should be thinking of initial or embodied impacts or whether in use or operational impacts or the two together. And sometimes people have different uh, concepts of uh, these different themes. Um, I also think that we have to be very much along the lines of multi-layered in our approach and multidisciplinary. Almost all of the work that I've been involved with over the last 15, 20 years, where I've been involved in some way or another with teaching architects, has had to take that kind of multidisciplinary uh, route. And that's not to uh, denigrate in any way the, the important role of architects, but to see them as part of an overall uh, professional culture that addresses sustainability. Um, most recently, though, I'd say some of my opinions have become um, very much more pragmatic than dogmatic. Uh, take my stance, uh, when I was a newly uh, graduate, new graduate student, I think I had very strong opinions about what energy environment meant um, and very dogmatic in those approaches, but I think I've become much more pragmatic as we re enter the real world, perhaps reflecting some of the things that Alex said at the very beginning of uh, today's talk. Um, but also to look forward to the future. Um, we need to think of the, the future in terms of opportunities, and these could be professional opportunities and also business opportunities. As uh, Seamus mentioned, I uh, did a book last year which had the focus on sustainability and profit. Um, the title was actually the idea of the publishers, I have to say, because they thought it would sell better with that kind of word in it. <laughs> um, I, I can't tell you whether it's uh, been successful or not in, in those terms. Uh, but anyway. Um, Plus another question would be, what level should we think of education as applying at? Um, undergraduate, well, most schools of architecture these days have been through a process of expansion. We have large groups of students, and um, it was quite interesting. Uh, about three weeks ago, I met one of the first students I taught in the School of Architecture at Sheffield when we had groups of about 40. We now have groups of about 140. Um, and it becomes very difficult when you've got a much more diverse, much greater group of students to try and deal with to get some of the messages across. So the education, the way we teach it, has to change a little bit. Um, many universities now have postgraduate courses, uh, some with very specific specialised titles. Um, and to what extent do we include or exclude elements within those postgraduate courses? How broad or how narrow should they be? Um, there's also the professional area. Um, we need to think about how we add the skills that we have or we're giving to new students, how we can give those to um, older people, dare I say, people already in the workforce. And there's international dimensions, relevance, examples from other countries, and some surprising sources. This is something that very much hit me when I was doing some of my own personal research, is that we, we all consider the USA as kind of the pariah state in all matters environmental. In fact, there are some excellent examples of good things happening there, um, but people kind of blank it out because uh, of the source of that information. Um, and I think there's also an issue of general skills enhancement and awareness raising. 
I mean, architects are concerned with people. We should be thinking about how we can talk to people in the general public, not just the specialists. And this was brought home to me very significantly just yesterday, actually. Uh, one of my research students returned from China, having collected some data. And he'd been talking about the sale of properties in Shanghai. And he said the people are selling properties there as being sustainable. And they're being snapped up by the, the public, or at least the, the purchasers, um, because they're not always just members of the general public. They can be organizations. But they're being snapped up on this label of uh, sustainability. And when he spoke to the designers about what sustainability meant, he said the response was, we use sustainable materials. We import our wood from Australia and Malaysia. And that was, so you can see the needs to be more general in understanding. Uh, another issue is about where is sustainable design? Um, it used to be thought of, I think, of as being designing the service systems and the components of buildings effectively, uh, choosing the right kind of materials for construction. Um, and maybe you know, the, the good practice of, of specific building design, but it's already been said this morning. We have to move beyond those single examples. We have to be thinking these days of, of development into neighborhood design uh, and urban design uh, and, in fact, get involved in regional planning. We can't just kind of segment the, the area of sustainable architecture and call it that little bit in the middle there. It has to be something more than that. And perhaps also bringing the area of application of assessment uh, ratings and standards. Um, just by way of a, a kind of metaphor in this respect, uh, this time last week I was invited to attend a meeting in Leeds, which was to discuss the setting up of a, 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 an academy, so-called an academy of sustainable communities which is one of the government in the UK's big ideas at the moment. Uh, but it shows where the government focuses is not on individual buildings, it's on communities and the whole uh, area of, of uh, buildings, not just the individual. We have to think bigger. So my view of this is that it's all of the above. Um, personal perspective, things that we've been involved in in the past or, or have been in the, uh, over the years, obviously traditional university levels of trying to ingrain sustainability into undergraduate teaching. It's, Lecture one, first year in my course, for instance, uh, but also in terms of developing postgraduate courses and trying to enhance how they can be uh, brought out into the community uh, and be made available as uh, professional development uh, modules. Also, uh, been involved in a number of different European projects over the year. Uh, ten years or so ago, we were looking at the curricula for building professionals and particularly in relation to energy and environmental matters. And that led on to further projects uh, involving dissemination um, beyond the specialists, uh, looking at particular uh, kinds of workshops that were being developed. Um, I've got some links here, but I think given the time, uh, limited time, I won't go into them. But uh, we can still find information about these projects that we undertook on the website uh, at Sheffield. One of the main findings, though, from these projects was, first of all, um, that we needed to take that multidisciplinary angle uh, but also we needed to look at it as a problem-solving event. And we actually encouraged workshops in not, which not just architects, but a whole range of other building professionals were set the task of solving a building design problem. And it was quite interesting how they did this in half a day and, and, and seeing what kind of ideas they came up with. Um, also involvement in professional development. Uh, we've run many numbers of uh, professional development courses and post-qualification courses over the years. Um, and in relation to various European projects and the energy design advice scheme as operated in the 1990s. Um, but I think we also see now international dimensions. Uh, I've been involved in various projects and teaching activities in places like Latvia, Greece, Australia. And I think that there are two, it's a two-way process. I can give something to them, but they can give something back. And I find the kind of teaching that I'm doing is not just uh, on the small scale now. It's actually looking at town planners and people involved in urban management. Um, we've also done quite a lot of research into teaching, the pedagogy, the kind of things that actually make a difference. Um, I don't know, we, we've got a mixture of people here, I guess students and, and teachers. Uh, it's interesting when you ask students what they think the best way of te uh, teaching sustainability is, and you ask staff which they think is the best way of teaching sustainability, and the two don't coincide as it happens, um, and something to be learned from that. Anyway, the, the, uh, perhaps the main feature of the talk is something that CMOS mentioned, which is the Educators for Sustainable Architecture group. Um, this grew out of a special interest group which was set up by CB, which is the Centre for Education in the Built Environment, a, a nationally funded body uh, based mainly in Cardiff that it does uh, also uh, have a, a link in Salford. And they had a special interest group on sustainability in, in which uh, they investigated how it was being taught in, in various uh, different schools of architecture. 
Um, and arising from that, uh, following the conclusion of that particular project, a number of us got together to create this organization, the Educators for Sustainable Architecture. Um, uh, it has a steering committee, uh, which holds regular meetings. One of its areas of work is trying to lobby for the cause of sustainability within the curriculum, uh, but also to act as a position where we can um, encourage information transfer between teachers and also to allow them to have a, a place to come together to discuss matters. So it helps to transfer ideas of good practice. Um, we've now established a series of annual seminars. The first seminar was held just over a year ago in Cardiff. Uh, that's the report of it. Perhaps to feature me uh, just in the, the corner there. Um, describing some ideas of good practice. We had the second meeting in Sheffield uh, just last month. Uh, interesting to see between the two we had about a threefold increase in the number of people attending and I'm hoping that that will uh, continue. The first event had about 15, we had over 40 in Sheffield. Uh, the next event um, I think is probably going to be held in Belfast in November uh, but that's not yet been confirmed. But, um, if anybody's interested they can contact me. Um, the meeting in Sheffield, a couple of the things we focused on were ideas and issues for teaching uh, methods for sustainability, that is how you might use lectures or what the problems and benefits of using lectures might be, how you could use seminars, how you might use teaching packages involving software, how uh, student-led activities could be in integrated, and really just to provide a platform for general discussion and to pass on uh, good ideas. Um, if anybody, as I say, is interested in ESA, please uh, uh, let me know. Um, there's also an area of changing emphases that I think results from all of this work and all the, the kind of accumulated experience of the recent years that I've, I've uh, come to recognize. Um, and most, yeah, I suppose, importantly, the, the kinds of things that are happening now. Uh, I don't know if many people read this, but in uh, newspapers about a month ago, the Vice Chancellor of the uh, University of Central England was complaining bitterly about a uh, new education policy which the HEFCE, which is the Education Funding Council in England, was introducing to encourage sustainability in all university curricula. You might say we've been doing it in architecture in some form or another for a long time, but this is everything. And there was great kind of, there's a bit of a groundswell against this, which is a bit disappointing, but nevertheless it's going to have an impact. Uh, there's also the upgrading of building regulations, which is going on. Uh, most of the seminars that I've been attending over the last month or so have been saying uh, people have got to get their head around the idea, especially in the UK, that uh, standard methods of construction in five or ten years' time simply won't meet the regulations, so they're going to have to start thinking differently. There's also the European directives that are coming out, the energy use or energy performance in buildings, already mentioned today. Emissions trading, which has started in Europe, started in the UK, but at the moment hasn't really taken off. But again, um, just over a month ago, I, I attended a meeting in Manchester, which is saying in about five years this is going to be a really key feature, <laughs> and buildings are going to be important there. Um, and also the UK government's stance on some of these matters, the Sustainable Communities Programme, including the National Academy, which is being set up. Um, altogether, I think this means a greater emphasis and importance of sustainability, energy efficiency, environmentally sensitive design. The kind of movement we've all been involved with for the last few years is going to continue and perhaps even become more acute. But there are a few things that we need to think about and take care of, and that's the need for being cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary in our actions, and also self-supportive, and mutually supportive in these things. Uh, I therefore come to my kind of concluding slide, which is to say uh, that we should be sustainable and help each other become sustainable, but we can't be autonomous. We have to work together. Architectural educators with specialist knowledge of sustainable design must be supported and sustained by colleagues who enable the integration of the topic into the whole curriculum. We can't do it by ourselves. We have to hope our colleagues also become interested in the topic, especially in the design studio. Um, the specialists themselves can't provide all of the skills and knowledge in their own working autonomously. We have to work together. Uh, and the sustainable design has to be something that all educators and professional disciplines subscribe to and work together to achieve in a mutually supportive mode. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Um, this was the last presentation of this morning. Um, I'm sorry that because we were running late, um, we don't actually have time to uh, discuss now, but I promise that um, well, there's somebody who's uh, really extremely anxious to ask a question. Um, 
or make a comment. Um, um, I'll find your microphone there. Thank, thank you very much, Simos. Um, just one quick point I wanted to raise before we go to lunch, because I wanted to give some food for discussion over lunch. Um, it's a two-part question, um, very much taken on the first presentation, practice and theory. The first question is not addressed to any of the speakers, but to the audience. Can I, by a show of hands, please see those students, those that are students, but are also not students of the AAEE course? In other words, nobody that is already enrolled in the environmental course. I'm interested in any other students of architecture, any kind. Can I have a show of hands, please? One, two, okay. Can I have a show of hands of students who are in the EE course, or have been in the past? It's almost everything else. Right, that is the point of practice. When it comes to theory, my second point is, this is a problem I see in education that's symptomatic. In other words, my question now to all of the speakers, or something we can talk about later, is a question, why do we have this particular problem? In the sense that, here, everybody knows how important the issue is. The subject is about education, linking education with architecture. We are in a very eminent school, the AA, internationally renowned, and yet we have only two students who are not EE members who are attending such an important seminar. I've been here, when Zaha Hadid comes, it's packed, people are queuing outside. When we talk about the environment, it is only half full and only two non ea students. That is something I would like to maybe give people food for thought, for discussion, maybe a little bit later, the question, why are we in this position? Because if we stay in this position, all of this, we will not move much further. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Well, food, food for thought, you said. So let's go for the food and um, do some thinking as well. And we'll come back at 2 o'clock. <laughs>